Part six of the general license upgrade class given by the Hearst Amateur Radio Club in October of 2019. Uh, this class was uh, given free of charge, and they allow me to post it just like the, the last videos I post. It's going to be somewhere between eight and nine parts. I uh, haven't really decided exactly yet, but, um, but this question pool lasts from 2019 to 2023. So if you're a technician and you're wanting to upgrade to general, this class is for you. I hope you enjoy it. Shut up and sit down. All right, talk about talk about get breaking things down a little smaller. We're gonna we looked at block diagrams. We're gonna look at something a little smaller than block diagrams. We're gonna look at a few components. How about oscillators? Well, oscillators are electronic oscillators are an electronic circuit that produces a repetitive oscillating electronic signal, like a sine wave possibly a square wave, but it's, it repeats over and over and over again. Oscillator's job is to convert a direct current to an alternating current signal. What they use is a feedback loop. Uh, this, is an, uh, an op this is a solid state oscillator, an operation amp, is an analog device. And what you do on that is you take some of the output, feed it back to the input, uh, we'll make it, feed it back to the input, and it oscillates over and over and over again. It uses, oscillator uses a feedback loop, some method of feeding some of the information that it generates back to the input. This is an LC oscillator. L, if you remember, is the abbreviation for inductor. C is the abbreviation we use for capacitor. And it's composed of an inductor, which is that thing that looks like a coil, and the capacitor, which is the thing that says C1 over there. And it drives, this, this particular one drives a transistor. This is tuned. The f rate of oscillation back and forth in there is dependent upon the value of the inductance and the value of the capacitance. You change one or change the other. Now think about this, we talk about that local oscillator at, at the beginning of your radio where we mixed that with the RF signal coming in to get a, a, a resulting signal that we could hear and we said we could tune that local oscillator to tune frequencies. Well what we usually tune is we usually have a variable capacitor. We usually tune the capacitor. So we tune the capacitor in that and we ch can change the oscillator. We, and you see those on your radio. That's the tuning dial, that's a capacitor. Like that right there. So we change that capacitor, and we change the frequency by changing that capacitor in that oscillator, leaving the coils being constant. Because it's easier to change a capacitor than, huh. what did I do? Easier to change the capacitance. There it is. change the inductance. What's called a tank circuit, a tuned tank circuit, consisting of inductance and capacitance. And you produce an oscillating waveform. We talked also about vacuum tubes, such as in the uh, vacuum tube amplifier. One of the popular vacuum tubes, the most basic one, is called a triode. A triode consists of three major operating components. Those components are a cathode, a grid, and an anode. And a cathode radiates electrons. It radiates it through the grid to the plate. It's inside of a glass envelope. There's a heater inside of that cathode. The heater, when it heats up the material in the cathode, it throws off electrons through thermotic emission. Kind of like this. The filament heats the cathode, which causes us to give off electrons. The electrons flow through this grid structure to the plate. Depending on the voltage on the grid, depend controls how much current, how much of those electrons get through. 
So you can vary the rate of electrons going through from the cathode to the plate by changing the, va the um, voltage on the grid, by changing the potential on the grid. In a schematic, it looks like this. The cathode radiates through the grid to the plate. Now, if you look at this, I'll pass one of these around. You can look up inside of here. This thing around the outside is the plate. You can look up at the inside and you can see the cathode. In the, in the, you can't see the cathode, but you can see the screen grid up inside of there. One of the things that we look about this, look at that, is remember what, a, what a, the, the schematic symbol for a capacitor looked like? The schematic symbol for a capacitor was two, alternate, two plates spaced apart with something in between. Look how much that looks like a capacitor. Well, it does have some capacitive tendencies. And those capacitive tendencies we don't really want necessarily inside of a tube. So we put another grid inside of there called a screen grid. And a screen grid's job is to block the control grid from the plate so it doesn't look like a capacitor in between. The, the uh, solid state equivalent to the to the um, triode is a field effect transistor. Field effect transistor, FET. The source is functions like the cathode. The drain, where the current goes out, looks like the plate, and the gate acts like the grid. Based on the difference in the level of voltage you put on the gate depends on how much current will flow through here. So you can have a large amount of current going through here controlled by a small amount of current on the gate or on the control grid. That's how you amplify. You take a big power supply and you put a, big, a lot of current through the, from the cathode to the plate and then you have that little bit of energy on the control grid and based on, 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 amp, on the amplitude of that signal going in the control grid, it will proportionally control that big current going from the cathode to the plate or the source to the drain. It, kind of like a valve, kind of like turning a valve off and on. That's what the control grid or the gate looks like. What do you think they call a vacuum tube in England? A valve. In Europe, they call those things valve. They don't call them vacuum tubes. They call them valves because that's how they operate. Kind of like makes it even makes more sense to me. I thought to begin with, that's kind of dumb, but it makes more sense to me that that's the way it operates. It's an electronic valve. Transistors and vacuum tubes act like electronic valves. It's also digital. Everything is becoming digital. I mean, you're, now we're talking about ones and twos. Or ones and zeros, I'm sorry, not ones and twos. Ones and zeros. We're talking about on states or off states. We're talking about digital electronics. Everything's becoming digital. Your radios have microprocessors in them. Software-defined radios use a, a microprocessor in them to, to uh, process your signal. So you have either off, which is a zero, or a one, which is on. It's called a binary state. This AND gate uses two binary states to control the output. The input controls the output. An AND gate means that in order for there to be high or on here, I have to have high there and high there. Okay, My input, high there. It's on, it's lit. No output. Doesn't satisfy the AND requirement. High there. No output yet because it doesn't satisfy the AND requirement. Ah, I got high on both of them. When this one and that one are high, that's on. High is usually a voltage level, like three volts or five volts or something like that. So that's how you can use that to control, as to control uh, the output. Then there's a NOR gate. NOR gate means not OR. Now, not or, what would you think or meant? Or would mean if that one or that one, if that one was high or that one was high, 
you'd have an output. But nor means not or. So that means is that when neither one of these are high, I have an output here. A nor gate. Mean and? Pardon? Or? Not, and? not or. Different than and. <laughs> if that one's high, well, that's normally on or gate, but that's just not or. So that, if that one's high, no output. If that one's high, no output. When neither one of them are high, when both of them are high, no output. When none of them are high, you get the output, which is what the first one we had. That's the difference between that. It's the op kind of opposite of an AND. It's the opposite of an AND gate. A NOR gate looks like this on the schematic, and that little dot there means not. That's how you can tell the difference between an OR gate and a NOR gate. The difference is that dot. Dot means NOR. Anytime you put a, a dot in the end, if you put a dot on the end of an AND gate, it would be called what? A NAND gate. It would be opposite, just opposite, work, just opposite what you think it would. There's also something called a shift register. Shift register is kind of a neat thing. It can take serial data. Serial data is data that comes along a single line, one piece of data after another, one piece of data after another. So a signal comes along a line. You got the first piece, data one, data two, data three. Data, it takes one piece at a time as it comes along the line. A lot of uh, computers and stuff use a line that sends multiple parallel data. That means it sends, it has several data lines, and it sends data through several lines at the same time. It's a lot faster. A shift register passes this data down. When the first bit comes in here, that's, if that's a zero, when the second bit comes, the zero goes down to here, and the next bit comes in. And then when the third bit comes in, these two shift down. They just keep shifting down through this device one bit at a time. But what they're doing is that if you want to parallel data, they've got four pieces of data available here that you can take in or out this way. So you can put data in this way and take it out that way. You can put serial data in this way and take multiple path parallel data out that way, out of a shift register. Shift register can also slow stuff down. It can also slow stuff down. You can convert parallel to serial data. You convert serial data. You can put parallel data in and get serial data out. A shift register can pass data one way or the other. That's another anal uh, digital device. All of this stuff is inside of integrated circuits. You'll probably all know what integrated circuits are. They're a semiconductor wafer. They're a piece of semiconductor material that has a whole bunch of microscopic circuits and components all embedded on that. Thousands or millions of tiny transistors, resistors, all tiny, smaller than these. <laughs> the little rectangular pieces are re resistors, right? That's a strip of resistor, the, the four assembly. The rectangular pieces are resistors. Inside of an integrated circuit, they're even smaller. That's, that's got a case around it. That has that, that that's got a that's got a that's got a case on it. That's got a, 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 a device that's holding. It's got an input and an output terminal on it. There's just a whole bunch of stuff inside. Well, your your CPUs, your radios, your computers, all are on integrated circuits now. They get thousands of them. There's a couple kinds that are popular: TTL and CMOS. Uh, TTL is transistor transistor logic, and CMOS is um, complementary metal oxide semiconductor. Uh, they both are essentially the same. They come in, in what's called dip packages, which kind of look like a roach, a uh, square piece with a bunch of legs out of it. They come in flat pack packs, which is like the dip, but the, the, uh, they don't go, the legs don't go through a hole. They go to pad in the board. They come in what's called SIP packages, which is single inline packages. And they come in, there's a larger package called an MMIC. And MMIC is a monolithic microwave integrated circuit. And that's used, typically used as a fixed gain amplifier. So the, the stuff we're looking at here is CMOS. CMOS has lower power consumption. TTL and CMOS, uh, most of the devices, a lot of the devices have the same type number on them. They operate the same way. They'll have a different serial number on them that tells them whether it's CMOS or, T, or TTL. And CMOS uses a lot less power. Complementary oxide, metal oxide semiconductor uses a lot less power. Solid state memory, that's how you're, you store stuff in your radio. 
You store stuff while you're processing it. You store memories for your radio cha frequency channels. Uh, all that stuff goes into solid state memory. Read-only memory is digital data that's permanently stored and not readily able to be changed. Essentially, the program in your radio that makes your, your solid state radio that makes your solid state radio work is that information is usually stored in a read-only me memory. Now, the, the manufacturer may allow you to ways to update it once in a while, but its job is to only be read. Its job is not to be job is not to be changed frequently, but only be read. Where on the other hand, random access memory is designed to allow the data contents to be readily changed all the time. Constantly changing as on, all the time. And when a memory is non-volatile, that means its contents remain if the power is removed. That's really nice that you can turn your laptop off and turn it back on and it comes back up and it's operating again. Before that time, when we had computers, we used to have a bunch of row of toggle switches. And you set all these toggle switches, you'd have to reprogram this thing, set these toggle switches, and then hit the button and set a bunch of other toggle switches and type a few things on the keyboard or the teletype and set a bunch of toggle switches to get the computer smart enough, because it couldn't remember this stuff. When you turned the power off, it all went away. So you had to get smart enough to start up. There wasn't any non-volatile memory at that time. Now there's non-volatile memory, that's great. The information's there, whatever you had there last, you turn it back on, it's there again, it's non-volatile. Diodes are really good for us. They turn AC, allow us to turn AC into DC, and they also allow us to detect radio signals. We have a couple kinds of, there's several diodes. Rectifier diodes are big ones. Their job is to do AC to DC. Uh, small signal diodes are ones that's usually used in radios, and they're usually used to detect radio signals. Let's see if I have some diodes here. And I guess I don't. No, yeah. There's a diode there. And it just looks like a resistor, not much different. Designed for circuits that need to convert alternating current to direct current. Rectifier diodes are. They're usually silicon. Um, they you design for large current loads. The peak inverse voltage is ranged from 50 to 1,000 volts. Peak inverse voltages, remember when you put an AC signal in, first you're putting in a positive signal, and then it alternates down, you put a negative signal in. And you put in the positive, it goes positive, and it goes negative. Well, the negative side of it, the inverse, it can handle, these can handle up to 50 to 100 volts, because it's going to strip off the, the negative side. So you can, there are ratings for either 50 to 100 volts peak inverse voltage. The forward, pardon? Pardon? 1,000 or 100? Oh, 1,000 volts. Yeah, up to 1,000 volts. The threshold, all of these have a, what they call a forward drop. If you put 10 volts into it, you're going to get a little less than 10 volts across it because of the junction. Here, the semiconductor junction, there's a voltage drop across that junction. The uh, rectifier diodes typically have a 0.7, a 7 tenths of a volt voltage drop across there. So if you put a volt in, you're going to get 3 tenths of a volt out. Put 12 volts in, you're going to get 11.3 volts out. So you need to kind of remember that in your, in your calculations on what you're good putting into what you're getting out. If you want to increase the current, you can put them in parallel. The current will split up. Let's say you can only get 50 volt um, diodes and you need at least 100 or a little less than 100 volts of current through them. We put 250 volts here and you split them up. The current will split up between the two of them. So you can increase the current by directing two in parallel. However, you need to put a resistor in here, a low wattage, low value resistor in there of the same wattage you want because manufacturing characteristics of these diodes aren't always the same and one may pass a little more current than the other one does. And so voltage always tries to go, current always tries to go through the path of the least resistance, which is that, this, this uh, junction here, and you may overload one of those. So this helps balance it out. The, the resistors, the series limiting resistors, of the individual dies help keep either one of those from carrying too much of their share of the load. Small signal diodes, they're little tiny ones, they're usually kind of, kind of glass looking ones. 
They're good for high frequency radio audio signals. They're usually made out of geranium, not silicon. They're designed for a lot smaller current loads because they're designed for, for really small voltages like you would be receiving with, using to receive, coming off your antenna. A crystal radio could be made out of one of those, so you're talking about really low value crystal, uh, low, low value RF signals coming in. They can typically handle about 100 milliamps or 200 milliamps of current. That's not a lot. Their threshold voltage is lower. It's about three tenths of a volt. But they're not any good for power supplies. They're, they're great for, for uh, RF signal detection. Of course, the light emitting diode, probably don't need to say too much about that. As long as you forward bias a light emitting diode, which means you connect the cathode to negative and the anode to positive, you get light. And they're using status indicators and backlighting, and they're, they're great. Everything's going LED now because of low current consumption. Even though they got low voltage requirements, a lot of the lights will have a, a power supply in them that takes the AC voltage down low enough that you can run LEDs. And um, compared to incandescent, they've got really low current consumption. The downside currently of a lot of, of LEDs is the markets, as far as lighting devices, uh, um, the market is being flooded by a bunch of low quality, low cost Japanese uh, lighting devices that don't have, that have noisy power supplies and just wipe out your radios. I had, I had, uh, I replaced in my shack, I replaced two fluorescent lights that I thought were noisy with two LED lights and turned on six meters and couldn't hear a thing and just wiped my radios out so I had to take the LEDs fluorescent light equivalents back out because they were horribly noisy. That's not the LEDs, it's the power supplies that go in there that is running them. The drivers. The drivers for the LEDs. Are they made in the United States or Japan or somewhere besides China? Yeah, they're, 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 you pay more. I thought $19 a piece was good for those. Uh, no, $19 down the drain. Yeah, I, can buy, I can buy better ones that, that have better, uh, that have quieter uh, generators on them. I saw the lights, it's radiating. It's radiating outside into my antenna is what it's doing. It's not radiating through my power supply, it's, it's going on. I was able to, some other power supplies, solid state power supplies I had, I was able to put some RF chokes on the power on the line and, and uh, choke that noise out because it was going into my power line. This is going right out, out through the window to the antenna on the outside. Now, I walked outside the house with, my, with a portable radio and could still hear them. But, LEDs are becoming very popular because they're, they're, they don't generate a lot of heat. They use a lot less uh, current. They're great. And they last a long time, too. Okay, review. Oscillator is an amplifier that operates with a positive feedback loop. The frequency of an LC, which is a L for inductor, C for capacitor, is determined by the inductance and the capacitance. Change one or the other, you change the frequency. An integrated, uh, integrated circuit operational amplifier is an analog device, excuse me, analog device. Diodes including LEDs conduct when forward biased. That means the, the uh, cathode is negative, the anode is positive. A silicon con rectifier diode converts alternating current to direct current with a threshold voltage drop of about seven tenths of a volt. Germanium sing small signal diodes are used for high frequency radio signals and the forward threshold voltage drop is about two tenths, about three tenths of a volt, I'm sorry, three tenths of a volt. The vacuum tube, electrons flow between the cathode and the plate. The control grid is in between them, it's a screen grid in between them, and it regulates or controls the flow of electron like a valve. The screen grid is between the grid and the plate to reduce the grid to plate capacitance, so it looks like a capacitor, it's in there to, make, to get the capacitance out of that tube. Talk about rectification. AC in, DC out. I've got a diode. The diode strips off that lower portion of my, my, my sine wave, of my AC sine wave. Got 60 cycles coming in. AC, it strips off the lower portion of that. Here's my voltage. Remember, it's peak to peak. Peak to peak. This is the peak voltage. This is the peak inverse voltage, the bottom side, the opposite voltage. 
When you're using one of those, pay attention to the current ratings and pay attention to the peak inverse voltage. If this is a hundred, if this peak inverse voltage here is a hundred volts, make sure you're using a diode that has at least a hundred volts peak inverse voltage rating on it. Don't overdrive it. And actually, you probably you ought to use about a factor of two. Don't get too close because if your voltage in your house is like mine, it runs from about 107 to about 118, 119 volts, depending on the time of day. This is called a half wave rectifier. We're going to look at a power supply here. Now, we're going to make us a power supply. We take an AC input. I take my 110 volts, 117 volts AC input, and I want to reduce this down to something more usable, like maybe 12 volts or someplace close to that. I can't put 12 volts right into there because I, I 110 10 volts in there because I can't do anything with it. So I've got to reduce it down, and I can't. What I need to do is I need to use a transformer. I need to use a transformer that has a different set of windings here, ratio versus windings here. So when I put 110 volts in here, I get 12 volts out of that end there. But I'm still getting AC. Now remember, I can't use DC in a transformer. Transformers only work with AC. So this is a half wave rectifier. It's called half wave because it cuts out half of that wave. That bottom part is missing. That bottom part is missing. I've got half of that wave. So I've got this pulsing. Now it's not pure DC. It's direct current. It's all going one direction, but it's pulsing. I'm getting DC direct current pulses. So I've got my, there's my anode, there's my cathode, and this is the load. This is what the power is going to be in the power supply. The so output frequency equals the input frequency. The peak is 1.4 volts RMS. The ripple, what's that ripple on there? 60 cycles going in, 121% coming back out. I've got a lot of ripple, a lot of noise on that. But I've got DC coming out. It's kind of a rough power supply. And I'm going to have to do a lot of work downstream to clean that up enough that I could use it. Or else, all I'm going to hear on my radio when I transmit is that hum at that frequency. Let's do a full wave rectifier. The nice thing about a full wave rectifier is the output frequency is two times the input. I've got two diodes, and I've center tapped this transformer. Now half of my, this is my common, okay, and this is my plus side. I connect them together. Half the time, this is conducting, and when this when, the, when it turns around, when it goes down below, this blocks and this conducts. So now what I've done is I've, for half the cycle, I'm conducting through this diode. The other half the cycle, I'm conducting through that diode. So now I'm getting both sides of that, but they're both DC. 1.4 volts RMS. My ripple's only 48% now. It's a little cleaner. I've got a lot cleaner signal. So a full wave rectifier uses two, it's a center tap transformer, and it uses two diodes to give me a signal that doesn't have, it's going to be easier to clean up. A bridge rectifier does the same thing a full wave rectifier does, but it needs four diodes. It conducts part, half the cycle around this side, half the cycle around that side. Gives me the same kind of output but I don't need a center tap transformer. Center tap transformers are more expensive. Center tap, tra tap transformers are harder to find. So typically, most circuits you're going to see use, will prefer to use a bridge rectifier, four diodes put together. And those come in a single, you don't have to tie solder four of them together. You can buy those in a, in a um, single package with four leads coming out of it. And that gives you a cleaner output. And that output, when you, put fil when you start trying to filter that output, the less peaks you have in there, the easier it is to filter that thing from AC to DC.
If I want to equalize current, you remember seeing the, the um, schematic before to increase the current? If I want to equalize the voltage, I put these two in parallel like this. I can get, you can increase the voltage by putting these in series. I can increase the current by putting them in parallel. I still need these resistors in here to kind of stabilize the variance that's in those, those uh, diodes. We're talking about power. We've got that pulsing DC in. We run into a thing called a filter choke. An inductor that smooths out the ripple to the DC. It kind of tends to buck and oppose AC coming in. It charges up a magnetic field and discharges a magnetic field on that choke and tends to smooth that circuit out. Then you put an electrolytic passer in there with a high capacity, which helps smooth it out as well, and a bleed resistor in here, which will discharge all this that capacitor when it's holding voltage when you turn the power supply off. But you can put a power supply filter consisting of a choke and a capacitor and a bleed resistor, and you can take the pulse eddy DC and smooth that thing out in the, sm in the smoother DC. The faster the rate that pulses, the easier it is to smooth out. They're switching power supplies. Now, we've talked about before we talked about the, with the transformer, we talked about an analog power supply. A big transformer that takes the voltage and it, it um, drops it down through the transformer, it rectifies it, it smooths it out and goes on. And they're big, they're, they're efficient, and they're heavy, um, and they're large. Because transformers are large, they take a lot of wire and a lot of core and everything. There's also a switching power supply which uses a little bit different approach. Rather than take, uh, rather than have a transformer, it has a rectifier and filter capacitors, and it actually takes that information in and switches it back and forth rather than to make AC out of it. The advantage of those is they're smaller size components, they're lighter weight, they have higher efficiency. The disadvantage is that this switching circuit in here has a, that runs the high output frequency transfer, the switching circuit in here tends to be noisy if they're not filtered properly. Filtering properly, they're, they're nice and quiet. I have several switching power supplies and they're nice and quiet. I have one that I had on my lights in the house that I plugged into the wall and it was noisy as could be. But it wasn't rated for radio frequency. The switching power supplies are found in a lot of the drivers for LEDs. A lot of the LED drivers use switching power supplies and that and most of them cut the components down in the circuit till they barely have enough that it does the job. They don't put spend the money and put a lot of filtering in it. And that's why a lot of the LED incandescent LED lights for, the, for lighting are noisy. Why the drivers are noisy. You can buy good ones. You can buy cheap switching to power supplies that are noisy. You can buy cheap good power switching power supplies that aren't. They contain specialized capacitors. They use a switching oscillator to generate that AC voltage rather than a, a transformer. And uh, they contain specialized capacitors. That's the, the, the key, and they're lightweight. That's the key um, characteristics of these. And of course, batteries. Y'all are familiar with batteries. You got one in your car. Depending on what kind of car you have, you might have a lot of batteries in your car. If you have a Prius, you got a lot of batteries in your car. Um, they're easily available, readily available, especially lead acid battery. Lead acid batteries are relatively readily available, easy to charge. They're forgiving. The disadvantages, they're heavy. Uh, sometimes they spill, and they may give off hydrogen gas when they're, dis uh, when they're charged. Uh, don't run your lead acid battery down to lower than 10.5 volts. That tends to start damaging the battery. When your battery gets down to about 10.5 volts, it's not good for your battery at all. Typically, they're used for automotive marine and use, marine deep discharge use, a little bit different than, uh, than automotive batteries. Um, a lot today, most automobile batteries and lead acid batteries are either gel cell or absorbed glass matte batteries. They're a lot easier to handle. They don't tend to spill. You can lay them on the side. Um, Sometimes they're a little bit picky to charge, but uh, they're a nice, uh, a nice backup. And, and of course, a lot of people are going to run portable. 
quite running one way to run your station off batteries. If you're going to run solar, you're going to need to run your station off batteries. You're going to need to have uh, batteries near for your solar supply at your house. More likely in your portable stuff, you're going to see an ICAD, a nickel cadmium battery. Nickel cadmium batteries, they're readily available, they're easy to charge, they're lightweight. They have a high discharge current because they've got a low internal resistance. Um, NICAD batteries are really kind of the battery of choice if you've got something that's going to draw a lot of power. Um, they have special deposed disposal requirements. They have a memory effect. Uh, if you don't discharge them far enough down before you recharge them, the, the usable charge cycle will decrease. If you take a ba battery and use it just a little bit and put it back on a charger, or leave them on a charger, you're going to find out that they seem to discharge faster when you use them in your electric drill than when you run the thing down quite a ways and recharge them. That's called a memory effect. So there, you've, you've seen them in your electric drill, your bottom of your drill, uh, in your, some of your radios have nic uh, nickel cadmium batteries. When you're going to power your, your radio in your vehicle, don't use a cigarette lighter. Most HF transceivers draw 20 amps or more in transmit. And even though your power port in your car may have a 20 amp fuse on it, don't try to use it. That one of the reasons that you want to use it is because it's in the same circuit as your computer in your car, so you may have a lot of computer interference, but those will overheat pretty quick. If you're going to run a mobile transceiver, you're better off running something directly, to, uh, your leads directly to the battery. Common wisdom is right now is to fuse them at the battery and fuse both the negative and the positive at the battery. A lot of manufacturers are now saying, no, don't do that, only fuse the positive because a lot of new cars have a voltage monitoring circuit on the negative terminal that monitors the electrical system in the car at the negative terminal in the battery. And you jumping over that with another um, power supply and putting a fuse in that um, may disrupt the readings on that. But the moral of this story is fuse it at the battery. If you're going to run a wire from the inside of your car through a hole in a firewall or something and out to your battery, put the fuse at the battery because if you're going to have a short, it's likely going to be where you run it through the firewall. So you want to not have it burn up there, you want it to kick the fuse at the battery. And run a heavy gauge wire, 10 gauge, 8 gauge, something like that. Another way, a lot of people like solar power. Solar power is great. Solar power is really good for off the grid whether you're operating portable off the grid or you want to run your home off the grid. Uh, solar power is great. It converts electricity from sunlight through photovoltaic conversion. It takes photons, like those torpedoes that, it, that Star Trek uses. It takes photons and converts them to electricity. A typical uh, solar cell has about five volt DC open, a half a volt DC open cell voltage. And you put a bunch of them in parallel. You parallel enough until you get the power that you want. Also in your circuit, you need a protection diode. You need a diode that only lets voltage run this way into your solar controller, which, control, which processes it to the right voltage and keeps your batteries charged. Why do you want that protection diode in there? Well, your solar panel, and you got voltage here, your solar panel is generating voltage as long as there's sunlight. When the sun goes down, all of a sudden your battery is going to try to go back and charge the solar cell. You don't want that. So that's why you put the protection diode here. Protection diode is to keep the battery from trying to go back into the solar cell to charge the solar cells when the sun goes down. Wind power. Wind power is even better than solar. Wind power works at night. What the wind doesn't blow all the time. So wind power typically real, needs a really large bank of batteries for energy storage because sometimes there's going to be no wind for several days. Even though there's going to be sun, there's going to be no wind. But it needs a really large bank of batteries. 
You notice the same thing, see the diode? The diode's there so that when the wind stops, the voltage don't go back. You don't look outside and see there's no wind around. You see your, your uh, turbine going like mad because your battery's running it like a motor. You don't want to do that. So that's what that is for, to keep your battery from powering the turbine, your wind turbine. That's why the protection diodes are. But they need a large set of batteries. Talk about resistors, and we're going to talk about components and how they're put together. Resistors in series. When you can put resistors in series, it's pretty simple. How do you figure out what you've got? Well, you simply add up the value of the resistors. For resistors in series, the total resistance is equal to the sum of each of the resistors. If you have 47 ohms, 10 ohms, and 500 ohms, you add them right up, you get 557 ohms. Kind of hint on your test, if they give you this and say calculate the, the um, total resistance here, well the first thing you can do is throw out anything that's smaller than the largest resistance. If I had a bunch of answers and three of the answers were, long, were smaller than 500, I know those aren't any good answers to begin with, I don't even have to add them up. Because it's always going to be greater, it's going to be the sum. And it's always going to be the total is always going to be larger than the value of any single resistor. In parallel, it's just the opposite. In parallel, the, the, the formula for parallel is the reciprocal of the sum of the reciprocals. So R1, 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3 and on down the line and then divide that into 1, that's going to be my total resistance. I'm going to sum the reciprocals and then take the reciprocal of that. So if I had 300 ohm resistors in series, reciprocal of 100, reciprocal of 100, reciprocal of 100, divided into 1 gives me 33.3 ohms. What do I notice about this? I notice that in a parallel resistance circuit, that the total resistance is always smaller than the value of the smallest resistor in here. Now it's only smaller than the value of any single resistor, it's smaller than the value of the smallest resistor. When you do the math, you're going to find out it's smaller than the value of the smallest resistor. Another quick hint for the test. If you're going to do that, before you do all the math, look at the answers. And if, if the answers, three of the answers are larger than the smallest resistor, you know you can throw those right out. Current flow. Current is, goes all the way around flows equal all the way through the entire circuit. Be nice to me. It's the same current going through all those resistors. One amp out of that battery, I get one amp through this resistor, through that resistor, and through that resistor. It's got no place else to go but give me one amp all the way around because the current has to flow through each of those resistors in that circuit to complete the circuit. Series circuit, the current's the same through all the resistors because the total current flows through each resistor. What do you think about a parallel? The parallel resistance is kind of like a highway. I got several routes to take. So if I got 20 cars driving, they don't have to follow one another. They can all split up in, in three different, different routes. In a parallel resistance, in a parallel resistive circuit, the total current comes down to here to where, the, where they join and it splits up through each of those resistors before it regain, rejoins at the top. And its, its value is proportional to the value of that resistor. On this one here, I can take Ohm's law. So I got this much current coming in here at the bottom. Ohm's law, I can fi find a current through that, re through, through that resistor knowing its resistance value. So in a cer parallel circuit, the current divides among the resistors and is proportional to the value of the resistor. Total current equals the sum of the currents through each branch. No math on this yet. Another component is an inductor. Inductor is often called a coil. Guess what it looks like? An inductor resists 
changes in electrical current passing through it. It doesn't like changes. It tends to oppose them. I probably already gave you one to look at. It doesn't like changes. It tends to oppose changes in current. It consists of a conductor wound into a coil. That's why an inductor, the schematic symbol for inductor, looks like a coil. When current flows through it, it stores energy temporarily in a magnetic field in the coil. So when you put current through that, that coil, it builds up a magnetic field within that coil, like an electromagnet. You probably, have, I don't know, in science class in school, if you ever took a bolt, you wind, wound wire around the bolt, hooked it to a battery, and picked up nails off the table. Well, that was an inductor you had, and it generated a, a, a current. It generated a current, generated a, mag a current, generated a magnetic field that picked up those um, nails. And when you turned the battery off, the nails, the, electric, the magnetic field collapsed, and the nails fell off. The unit of inductance is the Henry. I'm sorry, would you say it again? Yes, it does. A pasture stores energy in a, in a um, electrostatic field. Yep, an electrostatic field. This stores in a magnetic field, it stores in an electrostatic field. They behave differently based on frequency. We're going to talk about it in just a minute. Some examples of, of inductors, that's an air core coil because there's nothing in it. This is a tap coil because it's got a tap off of it. Somewhere along the line, we're going to pick up a tap. A toroid coil is wound into a donut. It concentrates the magnetic field in that donut shape. A ferrite core has a core inside of it that strengthens that magnetic field. And when you've got a core in it, the schematic symbol, that's the indication of a core. Toroidal inductors, are, you can get a lot of inductance out of a toroidal uh, inductor because the magnetic properties are pretty much contained within that circular core. And most of the magnetic field is contained in the core, it doesn't go outside the core. Reactance is what we call that of opposition. When I said it doesn't like to pass uh, current, reactance is its, its ability to block current. Reactance is the opposition of current flow in an inductor. And reactance is measured in ohms because it behaves like ohms. But it's dependent on frequency. Where ohm is co ohms are pretty much constant, reactance varies by frequency. Reactance in inductor decreases as the frequency increases. If you increase the frequency going into the inductor, its tendency to oppose current decreases. So at a low frequency, you got a lot of current. Because it's not opposing it. At high frequency, you don't get a lot of current because it's opposing the flow. It's still measuring in ohms. Inductors in series. Just like old, just like resistors in series, they behave just the same. Combine the same as resistors. Inductors in parallel act just like resistors in parallel. Let's talk about measurement devices. Multimeter, very popular measurement device because it measures voltage and resistance and current. All in one, devi one device, one meter. You turn the selector and you tell it what you want to measure. Put the probes on and you make the measurement. It's really great. You don't have to buy a separate meter for each one of them. You get either an analog meter that has a meter, that, a needle that swings back and forth and multiple scales that you read. They're not as precise as compared to a digital multimeter. But what you can see on them is you can see trends. 
If you've got a voltage, for example, that you're measuring a voltage and there's something that's causing it to vary back and forth, you can watch that needle go back and forth and you can see that something's causing my measurement to, to vary. On a digital meter, I'm just going to get a flurry of numbers that never, that never settle down. These are good if you're adjusting something. If you're, if you're using, a, you're adjusting a coil, it's a tuned circuit in your radio, and you've got an adjustment tool in there, and you're adjusting it back and forth, and you want to get a certain current, you can watch whether it's going up or down. It's really great. The downside of it is they usually have a low impedance input. That means the resistance on the input is low. Now, when you add that to a circuit, remember, it becomes a, 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 a parallel circuit. And in a parallel circuit, all of a sudden my resistance becomes lower than the lowest, lowest voltage, or lowest resistance. And with the lowest resistance in here, all of a sudden it becomes part of the circuit and it affects the circuit. It affects my measurement. So on some circuits, on critical circuits, it may load the circuit down. It may not really be a suitable device. Whereas digital multimeters usually are usually more precise because of the display. They can usually me measure to tenths or hundredths of a volt, for example, where on this one here, maybe a volt or a half a volt on the analogs, best you can get. You don't going to be able to see trends because if there's something fluctuating back and forth, you're just going to see a jumble of numbers. However, they typically have a high impedance input. So the measurement you're getting off of that is not affecting the device you're measuring and not affecting your reading. So there's an advantage to both of them. If you're going to work on your car, you're going to measure stuff in your car, use an analog. If you're going to do electronic circuits and stuff, use a digital. It doesn't hurt to have both of those in your toolbox. Let's look at a review. Half-wave rectifier. It requires only one diode. That's why it's called a half-wave. It, really, it outputs a series of pulses at the same frequency as, as the input. It just takes half the input. A full-wave rectifier, on the other hand, uses two diodes and a center tap transformer. It converts all of the, the AC cycle. You get it all and outputs a series of DC pulses at twice the frequency of the AC. Look at alternative energy. We talked about alternative energy sources. It's going to be a long night. Solar power or sunlight uses photovoltaic conversion to convert sunlight to electricity. They put out about 5 volts, the open circuit voltage is about 5 volts DC, and you want to put a diode in there so that when the, the sun's down, the battery doesn't discharge back through the, the um, solar cell. Wind power, because the wind doesn't blow all the time, you're going to need a larger, a large energy storage. You're going to need more batteries for that than you probably will for solar to provide the same amount of power. Resistors, when conducted in series, the total value is the sum. The total value will always be larger than the value of the largest resistor. When connected in parallel, the total value is reciprocal of the sum of the reciprocal values. And the total value will always be smaller than the value of the smallest resistor. If you're talking about ACE, um, RF circuits, radio frequency circuits, wire wound resistors are nice resistors. You take a piece of wire with high resistance and you wind it into a certain length and you know how many ohms there are per foot or per inch and you wind it, you can make some really nice precision resistors and you can make some really nice high power resistors with a wire around resistor. The downside of them is they look like our inductor, they're a coil. So you want to avoid wire around resistors in RF circuits because they look like inductors. So you want to use a carbon resistor or something like that. Inductors are also called a coil. Inductor is a passive electrical component, it's not active. The unit of inductance is the Henry. It stores energy in a magnetic field. That's how it, how it, how it stores its energy. It's how it resists or, or reacts to the, uh, to the current coming in. Inductive reactance is the resistance to changes in AC electric current passing through it. It's measured in ohms. And reactive as an inductor increases as the frequency increases. When connected in series, they behave just like resistors. We conduct it in parallel. They behave just like resistors. And they're used with resistors and power supplies and capacitors and power supplies to filter out uh, ripples in the DC voltage. They can also be used as a filter. Questions? Discussion? We made it. Continue studying your license manual.
Continue taking the online practice exams. AA9PW is a good one. QRZ is a good one. Um, if you take those, you should now be getting about two-thirds of the questions correct. If you've been studying your manual. Our next class, and our last class, will be Tuesday of next week.